are people you should have told me for the last 10 minutes i have been speaking and speaking and speaking uh okay okay chalo theek hai no issues i'll start once again i told you you should you can call me that something is wrong uh anyway so uh, we have done the three layers last time uh that's that's the troposphere which is the lowermost layer which has a lot of weather phenomena that take place a lot of in the sense 99.99% of the weather phenomena take place in the troposphere uh the the rate at which the temperatures fall away from the surface is called as the normal lapse rate it's a very important aspect when we come back to a few weather phenomena that we are going to do and uh, though lapse rate is a hypothetical phenomena uh, we are going to be we, we are going to be uh, discussing that uh, with reference to other lapse rates and uh, how that those lead to condensation and uh, uh, formation of clouds because you see that sometimes you see a lot of gathering of clouds but it does not rain sometimes there is a small bunch of clouds and it 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 tends to rain uh this is all basically because of the normal lapse rate on one hand and of course the local lapse rate on the other hand we speak key, we we keep speaking about this local environmental lapse rate we'll go to the details at some other time as i said uh, the thickness of the troposphere along the equator is around 16 and uh, it goes down to around 8 kilometers half of it uh, when you come to the poles so there is a huge variability as far as the thickness is concerned. At around uh, 12, 13 kilometers, you could say, uh, the temperature drops to minus 60 degrees centigrade. And after which, it starts rising. And it's, it rises, rises not in a geometric curve as such, but there is uh, there are variations as far as this rise is concerned. And uh, this is basically because in the next layer, where the temperature is rising. There is a zone of five kilometers wherein we have maximum amount of ozone, which is called as the ozone layer. Because it is called as the ozone layer, this whole layer is called as the stratosphere, strata layer, sedimentary rock strata. And we all know that as far as the ozone is concerned, it is uh, all uh, responsible for life on the land. And I've spoken in detail about the uh, holes punched into the ozone layer near the poles and we did discuss about the uh, problem as if you don't have habitation and industry near the poles why did we have these holes near the poles uh, that's basically because they are thinner because it is thinner near but it is uh, believed that uh, studies 2010 onwards show that uh, i would say um, various governments around the world I've been working on this and uh, the ozone hole seems to be uh, healing towards the last decade or so. Then we come to the stratopause, wherein again you have a U-turn, the temperature instead of rising now starts falling. Once again, and this is called as the mesosphere. Uh, the mesosphere is mainly responsible for burning off all the cosmic trash that tends to uh, collapse towards the surface of the Earth. Had it not burnt away, a majority of it, 80% of it is burnt away. So had it not burnt away, uh, there we would have been, uh, it would have been difficult uh, as far as uh, uh, the surface is concerned because it would be uh, bombarded with all these cosmic trash uh, that would have come at any point, any way uh, onto the surface as such. Uh, the mesopause, that's the upper limit of the uh, mesosphere is also called as the point, the coldest point of the atmosphere because uh, this is where the lowest temperature of the uh, atmospheric layers uh, exists. And uh, after this, you'll see that the temperature once again starts rising. Uh, and this is called as the thermosphere. Within the thermosphere, you have something written as the auroras. We are going to come to that as such. But the thermosphere is something which is uh, uh, very interesting we would be discussing about this the point of interest as far as the thermosphere 
is is concerned. You see that the temperatures rise very very fast in the uh, in in the thermosphere. Uh, this is the layering and of course the structuring of the atmosphere as such. And uh, let us now move ahead. I'm very sorry I uh, did not uh, switch on the audible uh, the audibility thing as such. Then, uh, as I said, uh, all this is now. What I try to do is uh, share my whole screen and uh, show you a few things. Okay, we'll revise the, a few things. What I've done is from a, a reference book, I have uh, basically taken up, uh, highlighted a few things. The atmosphere is divided vertically into four layers on the basis of the temperature. The troposphere term was coined in 1908. So you'll see that the study of the troposphere is, is, is what, nearly 115 years old. Okay, the term was coined by uh, Terence Bott, and it means region where uh, a lot of tumbling and turning over takes place. Uh, the temperature decreases, as I said, but in the book also you'll see that it has been highlighted, highlighted in the sense it has been typed in bold, the environmental lapse rate. Uh, then, I have highlighted this, but you may not get the connection of it right away a temperature inversion is said to exist let us leave this aside and uh, we'll come to this para here almost all clouds and certainly all precipitation as well as all our violent storms are born in the lower most layer of the atmosphere this is why the troposphere is often also called as the weather sphere then we come to the stratopause stratosphere sorry the stratosphere is just above the tropopause height of about 20 kilometers before it begins a sharp increase there continues to until the that continues until the stratopause it is encountered at a height of around 50 kilometers above the earth's surface higher temperatures occur in the stratosphere because uh, it is the layer that the atmospheric ozone is concentrated into uh, we need to recall that the ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiations from the sun. Then, let us move further. Mesosphere, the coldest temperatures anywhere in the atmosphere occur at the mesopause. The pressure at the base of the mesopause is only about one thousandth that at the sea level. This is another thing. Okay, and then we come to uh, the thermosphere. The fourth layer extends outward from the mesopause has no well-defined upper limit. That's an important point to note. It's called as the thermosphere. It contains only a tiny fraction of the atmospheric mass. It's extremely very rarefied air on the outermost layer. Temperature begin to increase due to the absorption of very short wave, high energy solar radiations by the atoms of nitrogen and oxygen. Temperatures rise to extremely high values I just I, this is an important thing that I wanted to highlight and I just put it up temperatures rise to extreme high values more than thousand degrees centigrade in the thermosphere but such temperatures are not comparable to those experienced near the earth's surface uh, basically because of the fact now we come to that particular point i told you the unique thing about the thermosphere earlier in the paragraph we have read that it is absolutely rarefied and we need we see that heat or temperature is concerned uh, it depends on how closely the particles are packed okay if you see the thermometer okay or human body thermometer say for example how do you test the temperature of the body, you are, uh, say you either place it in the armpit and then you close your armpit, isn't it? Or you place it uh, beneath your tongue and you close your mouth for a couple, uh, a few seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, as so. 
this type of sensing heat is called a sensible heat and sensible heat is dependent on the density of air particles unless and until the air particle touches the surface which is measuring your temperature say for example that mercury bulb that you see at one end of the thermometer unless and until uh, say the uh, say your body touches actually that mercury it will not reflect the temperature so in contrast to this in the thermosphere air particles are so rarefied so rarefied so rarefied that in spite of the fact that the particles temperature could be around 1000 degrees centigrade the chance of any particle touching the surface of the uh, say say the this instrument is absolutely near to zero and that is why our thermometers cannot be used to measure the temperatures in the therm thermosphere they use sensors and uh, very high uh, uh, say say high ended uh, thermometers made out of uh, advanced technology to measure the temperature of the thermos uh, of the thermosphere as such then there is a very interesting thing that comes within this and that's called as the ionosphere the ionosphere uh, is a uh, it's 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 not a layer which is uh, uh, basically based on temperature that is why you will see that it doesn't constitute in the four layers of the uh, other four layers of the atmosphere then what uh, basis the formation of the ionosphere these are electrical charges students doing their physics would they would have done ionosphere if not it hardly matters as such you'll see that around 80 kilometers up to 400 kilometers i have a slide of this i'll be showing it to you after i finish with this lower portions of the thermosphere and the atmosphere it is an electrically charged layer known as the ionosphere okay they absorb high energy short waves in this process each effect affected molecule or atom loses one or more electrons and becomes a positively charged ion and the electrons are set free to travel in electric currents most dense of this range is found between 80 and 400 kilometers as such now this is another thing the electrical structure of the ionosphere is not uniform it consists of further three layers varying on the ion density from the bottom to top these layers are called as d e and f layers respectively because the production of ions requires direct solar radiation the concentration of charged particles of charged particles uh, varies from day and night particularly in the d and f layers and it's because of this that uh, towards the poles you have uh, these electrical charges when they brush against the uh, magnetism or the uh, of, of near the poles being higher they come up with these beautiful uh, patterns that you can see and these are called as the northern lights of course it's not that you have them only in the northern hemisphere you have them in the southern hemisphere as well uh, northern hemisphere they are called as uh, 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 aurora borealis and in the southern hemisphere they are called as uh, 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 aurora australis you can go to youtube and type aurora and uh, you will you'll get beautiful clips of how these patterns are seen uh, and you'll see that norway is known for this okay uh, these these are called and, and that's why it's called as the northern lights also as yes, so uh, uh, we will we'll, I'll, I'll just come back to showing you the auroras in the structure of the atmosphere but uh, before that we need to take up one more thing here you will see that the ionosphere again as I said now the numbers we may vary from book to book the earlier book said 80 to 400 here it says 80 to 640 kilometers I just uh, increase the size because it's only this part sorry, that we need to read through there are a number of ionic layers with increasing height again you'll see that there we did not have the g layer here you have the g layer and uh, with the d e f and g between uh, the uh, this they, they they reflect signals of low radio frequency waves 
and absorb medium and high. Uh, e layer is also known as the Kenley Heaviside layer. It's confined to the heights of uh, 100 to 130. It reflects medium and high frequency the waves to the earth. This layer is produced due to the interaction of solar ultraviolet photons with nitrogen, nitrogen molecules. And it disappears with sunset. That's very interesting. And then you have the sporadic E layer, which is associated with high velocity winds that create special circumstances. This is uh, the auroras. Uh, this layer reflects very high frequency radio waves. So we'll see that the earlier one is low, this is medium, and this is high frequency. And then you have the F layer, which consists of two sub layers, F1 and F2, collectively called as the Appleton layer. These layers reflect medium and high frequency radio waves back to the Earth. And then you have the G layer, which is 400 kilometers above. Most probably persists day and night, but is not easily detected. So uh, that's that's what I wanted to bring to your notice from the text because we tend to miss out or miss out these minor points on uh, 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 e, uh, e lecture. I would rather say. So I would uh, come back here and uh, take you back to my presentation. I'll first stop this the earlier presentation. Then uh, I would uh, just give me a couple of seconds. I'll present it once again now. And uh, this is what we were doing. Okay, so you'll see that now here. In the thermosphere, you can see the auroras. Okay, so uh, it's it's the electrical charges versus the magnetism of the Earth's poles that brings out these patterns. As I said, you could just go to the net and uh, have a look at these beautiful patterns. Uh, we did speak about the ionic layers, the ionosphere, as such. Okay, and uh, basically. I would like to I'll just again reflect on these. Okay, you see that uh, you have the D, E, F. It does not show the G layer as such, but then it's beyond this. So uh, this is how it is. Okay, the F1 layer is not seen here during the night time. That's very interesting. The E layer, sorry, the D layer also is not seen here. Okay, so that's but the layers are sequential from low frequency radio waves to high frequency radio waves. They reflect them. These are more of the similar places where they are placed. D e layer 70 kilometers, D e layer 120, F1 layer 200, F2 300 to 400 kilometers. How do you place them? Otherwise, you'll see that here you have the as. This, this light is all about the auroras, E1, E2, sporadic, sporadic layers, sporadic E layers. Okay, radio frequency signals, middle wave, high frequency, middle frequency, very high frequency waves. Yes. Okay, and uh, what else? Uh, during the daytime and during the nighttime. Okay. Now let's move ahead. This light which comes to us from the sun is also called as the electromagnetic spectrum. I believe electromagnetic spectrum is something that we have done at an earlier, uh, you have done at an earlier uh, time in I think 11th or 12th standard. I'm not very uh, sure, but uh, I, I have a fair idea that you do had, or rather, you all had electromagnetic uh, thing, electromagnetic spectrum as such. Now, why is it called as a spectrum? Basically, because a spectrum is something which has many, many things in it. And that's why I would uh, first like to reflect on this part. 
students of physics, X-rays, ultraviolet, gamma rays. Okay, we'll see that uh, the wavelength of these gamma, X-rays, ultraviolet is uh, very interesting here. 10 raised to minus 14, 10 raised to minus 12, 10 raised to minus 10, 10 raised to minus 8. Okay? And then around 10 raised to minus 6, you have this visible spectrum. The human eyes can respond only to this aspect. Okay, So what we see around us is only within this particular frequency. There is a lot of thing that is happening towards this side. There's a lot of things that's happening towards this side. And uh, you'll see that X-rays, etc. All these equipments that nowadays we use, they are actually using this frequency. Now, when the crests of that frequency are, uh, say, are packed together, packed together, many, many crests within micromillimeters, etc., etc., you're going to call them as short waves. On the other hand, as the distance between the crest increases, okay, from plus two, uh, two, that's hundred kilometers, that's four, that's thousand kilometers. You see that they are going to be called differently as such. Okay, this is a microwave. And then you have FM. Okay, FM is somewhere here. Okay, VHF. Okay, AM and uh, ALM. This, these are radio waves. Now, interestingly, I let me see how many, how much physics you know or how much science you have uh, understood out of this. Now you'll see that AM is a longer frequency and FM is a shorter frequency. What is, what, what is, why is it that uh, FM is more preferred to AM nowadays? Though the fact that AM rays can travel longer, what is the reason that FM Nowadays, is preferred more than AM. Anybody can answer. I'll give you a couple of seconds for that. And unmute yourself and you can answer. AM waves can travel for thousands of kilometers, let me tell you. But the uh, problem with FM is that they can't travel for long. But then why do we use FM? Yeah, anybody? And let me know the answer. Why do we use FM so regularly? You hear FM, right? Your FM channels, etc. on your mobile phones. You never thought of the fact that why is it that FM is used? Why is it that AM, though it is there as a part of your frequency on your mobile phones, we hardly use AM. Okay, I'll give you the answer. The fact that FM gives you more clarity. Okay, digital music as it is called. FM gives you more clarity of, of voice and sound. And it gives you variation also. That makes listening uh, a, a more uh, fair pleasure as compared to AM. And that is why, though it does not travel much. You can see that every FM channel has its own studio in a respective uh, city, you'll see that you have uh, FM channels of uh, what, Big FM, and, uh, Vivid Bharati, and uh, Radio City, and uh, I can think of these only in Pune, but they'll have them in Mumbai also. If you have uh, at any point of time traveled from Pune to Mumbai or vice versa, uh, somewhere in between, Okay, you see your radio tries starts catching both the frequencies. So at one, and this particularly happens during the ghats. So at one curve, you'll see you are hearing a song from played in Pune FM, and at the other curve, you are hearing a song song played in Mumbai FM of the respective channel. So that's a very funny experience uh, one tends to have uh, when you travel with your FM uh, uh, FM channels on. Uh, if we are to go into the actual comparison of these things, how big is one micro, micrometer, sir? How big is one micrometer? Okay, you'll see that 40 to 50, uh, 40, between 40 and 20 micrometers, it's the uh, diameter of a single human hair. Okay, diameter of a single human hair. And you go further down, 5 to 10, okay, that becomes a uh, human blood cell. This is a human blood cell. 
Uh, you go further down, a spider web silk thread is again so very thin, but you can just, we, we all know the strength of it is. And then you go further down to one micrometer, that's basically a bacteria. And from micrometer, you go to nanometers. Here is where COVID comes from. Virus is 30 to 50 nanometers. You have uh, uh, these various viruses. Uh, what I wanted to reflect on is a few more things. That's uh, uh, basically that uh, the energy that comes from the sun is basically spread into a huge spectrum. We, are, we actually are using a very small spectrum. I just forgot to go back, uh, go into that aspect as such. You'll see that uh, as far as human eye is concerned, it starts sensing anything from 0 0.4 micrometers. And uh, it extends up to 0 0.7 micrometers from blue to, or, or I, I would rather say violet, to uh, red. And uh, that's where we uh, abbreviate it as V I B G Y O R, Vibjor, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Vibjor is uh, the abbreviation. Uh, invariably, you'll see that because green is uh, toward the center of the spectrum, you'll find it in maximum extension all around you. You'll see that all greenery uh, vegetation takes up green because green has a tendency to absorb uh, energy and that's how photosynthesis takes place. So that's one more thing. And uh, you see that the very reason that you have red on your uh, traffic signals, the red on traffic signals is basically because it's one of those colors which, is, which can be detected by the human eye, can be detected from, by the human eye from a very long distance. And that's why it's not that somebody chose that, OK, let red be the color of uh, the, the, the traffic to stop and so on and so forth. So that's uh, some information that I wanted to pass to you all as such. And then uh, those who are confused about what this is, a micrometer. International, this is the international spelling used as by, I'll just pick this up from Google as used by the International Bureau of Rates and Measures, that's SI units. Micrometer, so you'll see that here it is RE, the last two letters. Here it is ER. This is the way the Americans write it. And this is more commonly known as a micro, is uh, an SI unit of length equaling 1 into 10 raised to minus 6. So uh, it's, it's, it's a millionth part of a meter. If you take a meter long stick and you divide it into uh, one million parts, that one part of those millions of parts is going to be called as a micro. Okay, so uh, that is that that's that's one thing that I wanted to tell you. And then uh, there is one more thing that I wanted to bring to your notice is uh, these. Uh, from smallest to largest, okay, commonly used units shown in bold italics. Normally, we don't look into it, but I purposely wanted science students because uh, you may go into these uh, details as such. Okay. Now, uh, you'll see that somewhere here, you have millimeter, centimeter, decimeter, meter. Okay, so a millionth part, one, two, three, four, five, okay. This, this is uh, one meter is, uh, sorry, yeah, 100,000, 10,000, one million, and one million. Okay, so the million part is micrometer. And similarly, it increases this side. Okay, from meter, you go down. Okay, you go down from meter, decimeter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and then you go nanometer. You have picometer. Femtometer, atometer, zectometer, and uh, we'll have uh, yoctometer, which is 10 raised to minus 24 meters. Like minus 24 means 24 zeros in a minus way. On the other side, okay, now you'll see that uh, you can, if, if you are forced to remember this, 
this is how you remember this is plus 24 this is yota meter so this is why this is why as well yota this is yota okay this is zeta meter this is zepto meter so z again yes so these two things can easily be remembered and then you have the examiter beta meter tetra meter gigameter megameter kilometer and then you come down to hecto that's hectare hectometer decameter and meter okay this is for information purpose uh, then uh, that's all as far as the uh, structure of the atmosphere is uh, concerned uh, believe me that uh, henceforth we are not going to travel into the atmosphere vertically we are going to restrict ourselves to the first of the layers but because the other layers are also important we uh, we we actually felt it fine and logical to study the structure of the atmosphere vertically but as i said let me tell you that uh, uh, when we speak about this, uh, the, the lowermost layer of the atmosphere, it, uh, it, it, it becomes wise when we already have studied the upper layers as such. Now, a lot of things that we study as weather are dependent on many, many things that uh, actually are uh, said to be things of common sense, but uh, we never uh, go into those details and unfortunately you see that uh, we, 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 uh, we, we tend to miss out on those and then we when we come to a higher level of understanding because we have not done those basics uh, it tends to get a bit difficult for us to understand a few more things uh, and as a consequence what I'm going to do is sorry what I'm going to do is uh, sorry Okay. This is the normal earth and uh, this is how the earth is placed on 21st or 22nd of March. The sun is vertical at the equator. These lines that you see across the earth, the Arctic Circle, the Tropic of Cancer, the equator, the Tropic of Capricorn, and of course down here you would be having the Antarctic Circle, which is not seen here. Uh, a very slender line you can see here is it. That's one thing. Now what divides the Earth into these lines is very interesting. It's very important. You'll see that uh, if you see this swirl that you are seeing here, and uh, this line across that you, are, you that you are seeing, this is the axis of the earth. All of us know that the axis of the earth is not a vertical line. And this is the main thing that you have to understand when you are learning climatology. To start with the first thing, I would rather say climatology is all dependent on how the energy from the sun gets distributed over the surface in response to the axis of the earth. Presently, this axis is 23 and a half degrees. Uh, but let me tell you that climate change uh, uh, evidences have shown that uh, it can fall down to 22 degrees. It can increase to 24 degrees. Presently, it is 23 and a half degrees, let me tell you. So, <coughs> sorry. see here that we can see that this angle to the vertical is 23 and a half degrees. Now all being students of science, the next thing that I want you all to observe is this 23 and a half degrees has some logic, has some mathematics, has some geometry with regards the uh, various lines that we just spoke about, that is uh, the equator, the Tropic of Cancer, 
uh, the topic of Capricorn or the Arctic and the Antarctic Circle. My exercise to all of you all tomorrow is to give me the geographic references, the geographic importance of these lines. Let me tell you that these lines are not arbitrary lines. There is some geometry behind it. There is some geography behind it. And uh, if, you, if you get it earlier, you could obviously paste it in the group. If you don't get it, uh, we, would, we would refer to it. In fact, if you have done your geography well in your schools, the, the, the second diagram that I have just brought into focus right now, okay, the second diagram, this one, uh, should help you to uh, understand what actually is happening. We're going to do this in detail tomorrow. But, uh, of course, I'm not going to leave you right away. We have, what, around 15 minutes to go. Uh, I have a few things planned for you all. Uh, but to start with, as I said, the sun is the major source of uh, heat and energy. But as far as how this heat and energy arrives onto the surface is decided by the axis of the Earth, which then runs into various other aspects. We're going to go into the details. This sequence, understanding this sequence is very, 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 very important. The moment you understand this sequence, understanding anything in climatology is absolutely easy. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure about that. It's absolutely easy as such. I'll leave you with this question for the day. And uh, I, will, I will show you a few clips that I have gathered on the... Uh, YouTube. Let's see how many we can see today. Others can be seen tomorrow. And uh, let me see if uh, I am able to. So let's try to present the tab. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is something to do with, uh, uh, we, we hear about a lot of climate change, etc., etc. Uh, this guy in this uh, documentary tries to convince us about uh, how climate change is, uh, uh, I would say, a, a fact around us. Let's not beat around the rapidly melting iceberg here. Climate change is happening and we are causing it. The evidence is overwhelming. Scientists usually reserve this level of agreement for claims like Earth is a planet or air is real. Yet here we are. The climate change ship has now left the dock, yet lots of people on shore are still debating whether boats can actually float. But maybe you're a person who trusts and accepts what climate scientists are telling us. It's just sometimes it's hard to explain why. I mean, we've all been there. I mean, I care about the environment. I figure with the polar bears and everything, we might as well try electric cars. What do we have to lose? And then they go caps lock serious, saying they have proof that climate change is a hoax perpetuated by scientists paid off by the polar bear lobby as part of a plan to install Al Gore as Supreme World Polar Bear Emperor. Wake up, sheeple. To keep that from happening, we put together this handy reference. The sun is the source of warmth on Earth, so thanks for that, sun. Ice and clouds reflect some of its light away, but the rest is absorbed by land and water and re-emitted as heat. Some of that heat escapes to space, and some is held in by the atmospheric greenhouse effect. The insulating effect of Earth's greenhouse gases are the reason that life exists as we know it, but human activities have increased the concentration of one of them, carbon dioxide, 40% since the Industrial Revolution. We know the sun's output has varied during history, but since the 1970s, the period when global temperatures increased the fastest, temperature and solar activity have moved in opposite directions. If the sun was to blame, it would cook the upper and lower layers of the atmosphere together. Instead, we only see warming in the lower layers, the same plates that human greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide side are piling up. Since 1870, with fossil fuels, cement production, and land use combined, humans have put about 2,000 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. 
That's two million million tons, and about 40% has stayed there. Studying gases trapped in ice cores has let us see what Earth's atmosphere was like in the past. At more than 400 parts per million, today's carbon dioxide levels are the highest they've been for almost a million years. That's before humans even existed. Totally uncharted territory for us. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means average temperatures across the globe are increasing, and fast. Right now, Earth is warming about 10 times faster than at the end of an ice age. Okay, so CO2 is increasing. How do we know it's our fault? The best evidence comes from looking at what isotopes, or different kinds of carbon, are in the atmosphere. Fossil fuels come mainly from old plants. Plants prefer to use the lighter isotope carbon-12 over the heavier carbon-13, so they contain a higher ratio of 12 to 13 than the atmosphere does. When more fossil fuels get burned, the percentage of carbon-12 in the atmosphere should go up, and that's exactly what we see. And it's not because of volcanic activity. Volcanoes only emit about 1% as much CO2 as we do. Normally that CO2 is balanced in exchange between the atmosphere, plants, and animals. But eliminating carbon sinks has released centuries worth in just a few years. Other greenhouse gases are also increasing, like methane from farm animals and natural gas processing, or nitrous oxide from fertilizers. If we run simulations just using natural causes of climate change, they predict no change or even cooling in the 20th century. And that is not what's happening. It's still going to get cold in some places, but in the 2000s, there were twice as many record highs as record lows. And each of the past three decades has been warmer than any other decade since we started measuring in 1850. Since 1900, actual temperatures around the world have increased almost a full degree, and most of that has happened since the 1970s. Looking at data from tree rings and ice cores, the past 30 years is probably the warmest in eight centuries. Of course, not every place on Earth warms equally. Oceans cover more than 70% of Earth, and they absorb more than 90% of the heat added to the planet. Naturally, that's where we see the most extreme changes. Around the world, oceans are rising a tenth of an inch per year, and they're up eight inches since 1901. This is because water expands as it warms. And when ice sheets and glaciers melt in Greenland and Antarctica, water that's normally on frozen land gets put in the ocean. The oceans are Earth's largest carbon sink. As more CO2 enters the atmosphere, more of it dissolves in the ocean, which makes the water more acidic. This doesn't mean the oceans will be made of acid, but animals with calcium shells are super sensitive to pH. We're on course for the oceans to hit pH 7.8 in 100 years, which could wipe out one third of species in the ocean. We also know that levels of summer sea ice in the Arctic have decreased 40% since 1978. They might be the lowest levels in 1400 years. That white sea ice usually reflects the sun's energy back into the atmosphere, but the dark ocean is soaking it up like a black shirt on a sunny day, which feeds the cycle forward. If CO2 emissions continue on their current trends, Earth is on course to be two and a half to five degrees warmer. The oceans could be up to a meter higher by the end of this century. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it's the biggest deal. This is by far the greatest issue facing our species. The last time the Earth averaged a few degrees colder, most of North America was covered in a mile thick sheet of ice. That many degrees warmer? We're gonna have a bad time. So now you're armed with the facts, why we know climate change is happening and why we're causing it. Please share this information with the Okay, so uh, this is uh, some scary information, but uh, for the last few minutes, I would be sharing a very beautiful clip that I uh, again gathered on the net, and uh, it's 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 one of the best that uh, has come across to me. I will uh, just check if I can put it on. Just bring it up. Dot co dot in. Tech designed for all you do with wide viewing angle display. Now available with exclusive offers and benefits. Enjoy easy customer. This is one of the most fantastic displays of what actually happens about, above us through the earth. 
the more we look at it, the more amazed we are. The colors that it brings about. And of course the patterns that it brings about. We hardly look at it during the regular activities of our life, but then they keep happening relentlessly around us. This is basically exchange of energy, exchange of pressure, etc., which of course we are going to do in detail. This is how this is. Those lovely colors, which hardly can be seen otherwise. These are real footage in Britain. These are the various storms that cross across. tornado Associate, he spoke about it, right? On the whole of it. Goes on layer, it protects us. An obvious question.
okay uh, that's that's what i had for today i have a couple of more clips uh, as far as understanding of the mechanics of the atmosphere is concerned i uh, we keep calling it that atmosphere you'll see that even in this clip they called it that atmosphere but let me tell you that uh, they called it that atmosphere only because of the fact that they uh, were speaking about the meteors burning and uh, the uh, ozone layer otherwise majority of the coverage was about the atmosphere is an important thing that we have to understand uh well i've given you some homework i have a few clips for you tomorrow um what else do i speak to you all about today i um, i cannot think of anything special that i had told i thought about yeah uh i am uh, i have around a list of seven students who seem to have issues with their internal marks i will take it up uh, Uh, today i'll verify your marks and let the exam department know it accordingly i will put the same on the group as well and uh, now if you have any queries as to what we have done throughout the day uh, throughout the lecture you could please ask me your questions or else in a couple of minutes we can wind up sir why did the aurora why are the auroras not visible uh, let me just read the message so why are the auroras not visible in other regions of the poles obviously because of the magnetic activity is more intense near the poles the magnetic activity is more intense near the poles that's why they are seen there Okay, you see that it does not uh, 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 have uh, that much of intensity when we are looking around the equator, uh, etc. Uh, so that's why. You know, you all had answered a few things. Is amplitude remains constant? It's amplitude remains constant. Yeah, FM is that, but then uh, FM requires more energy. Yes, because it's a shorter wave as compared to the uh, am frequency okay so all this was uh, the questions any other questions you have you could ask or you could keep it for tomorrow no issues we'll be speaking about uh, a similar things tomorrow i just stop the recording here if you don't have any queries